everybody. Welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is episode 225, recorded on October 31st. It's our spooky Halloween edition, so I'm wearing the scary costume. I'm Ryan Shrout. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Alan Malventano. And I'm Chris Barberi. Not Josh Walworth, apparently. Not Josh Walworth. Uh, Josh is out... I don't know the time difference. He's walking his kids around the neighborhood, taking candy from strangers. I don't know what goes on, um, but it is Halloween. We're recording on Halloween night in, in celebration. We're going to play a little Left 4 Dead 2 after the podcast. So if you're listening live and you want to get your Left 4 Dead 2 set up and updated and configured or installed or something like that, feel free to go ahead and start. I guess I'm also wearing this stupid hat in uh, celebration slash discussion about the merger, the purchase of Lucasfilm into the Disney family. I know some people don't like it. I think it will be great. More movies for everybody, I say. Maybe they'll have extra Jar Jar Binkses. Who knows, right? <laughs> you just, we'll just have to wait and see. Um, so let's dive into tech news from the week. Not a whole lot of real uh, in-depth stuff. Not a whole lot of uh, reviews coming out. We had one editorial that had a lot of discussion. This is actually from Scott, who wanted to be on the show tonight but could not make it. He couldn't get out of work. Uh, titled, The Windows You Love Is Gone. And I will take the credit for the title, but nothing else uh, in, inside of it. So this is it's an editorial he wrote that looks at uh, the transitions into Windows RT, Windows 8, how the App Store is uh, maybe a little bit of a controlling factor. Um, and some of the potential issues that come out of it. I think the biggest potential issue is the fact that there is, a, again, to use that word again, a potential problem with the idea of Microsoft being able to filter or uh, decide what applications come out. His, uh, his theory is that Windows RT is the end goal for everything. They want everything to be in the Metro interface. And if that's the case, Anything you install would have to come, at least by the, set, the, the way things work today, would have to come from the App Store. So you are a little bit uh, – you could see if, if this goes worst-case scenario, how you'd be a little bit concerned about it. It, it touches on that this is why Steam and, Lin, or Steam and Valve wanted to move to the Linux platform and why uh, Gabe Newell had such a problem with Windows 8. And actually, uh, the, the reason the story got picked up so largely was because the developer of Minecraft, who I saw at least two kids walking around at Halloween today dressed up as, as I don't know, I guess dressed up as a Minecraft character with a block head with pixels and a pixel axe, um, Notch retweeted the story that uh, we had sent out. So that, that drove in a lot of traffic from it as well. So um, it's... It's an interesting editorial. It has a ton of comments on it. I encourage everybody to go read it and give us their feedback. We'll try to have Scott on another episode next week, I guess, or something, and, and kind of get his, his, his verbal feedback on not only the article, but the responses and the comments and kind of what general people's general consensus are. I think there's – my personal opinion is I think it's a little too early to, to get this kind of uh, – I don't know, conspiracy theorist about it. But I, I definitely see that angle if, uh, if you take it to its kind of worst case scenario. And, and obviously, if people like Gabe Newell are worried about it to the point where they're releasing Steam coming up, like, right, isn't the beta starting this week or this month or something like that? Well, maybe November for yeah. Linux. Steam, I want to sign up for that. Let's see what the user experience is like. Let's see what the performance is like. And if they can make that a, a viable alternative. So, any, any thoughts on that from anybody? I think it's too early as well. I'm sort of, you know, you just got to see how the thing is going to pan out. Yeah. And I know a lot of the underlying tech in there, like a lot of people that, I don't know. I, I don't, if, if I, I'm not running Windows 8 yet myself, right. right? But if I was, I would be ignoring Metro anyway. And who really cares about that part of the thing? And, Ken and the I, development when, side. when we did our know. build, we kind of came to the conclusion that if you want to use the desktop, you can still just use the desktop. The only time you really are forced to see the Metro interface is when you hit the start button. And the only reason I use the start button is to hit start and start typing in a name of an application. And you can still do that. Mm -hmm. and works exactly the same. Works exactly the same. It just looks a little bit different while you're doing it. Now, did you try, um, go ahead. Did you try start eight? 
by chance? Start eight? Yeah, Stardock makes it. Oh. It's called Start and then the number oh, oh, eight. No, 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 no. I have not. It I was trying to not takes... do any of the hacks for it yet. Oh, you're not you're not going for that yet? Not yet. I wanted to I wanted to I want to use the operating system. I want to form an opinion about it and what the general consensus consensus of a user would be of an end user. Because you know, I had I had several friends text me on Friday and over the weekend. It's like, hey, I was going to upgrade to Windows 8. Um, do you think I should do that with this system or this system and all that kind of deal? Uh, if you're the type of person that hits start and then goes to all programs and browses through your applications in that way, then it's going to act. I don't even know you can you can't even really get to a, a menu like that anymore, right? So, you know, you're, it is going to have to change the way you do that. I think the hit start, start typing what you're looking for anyway is the way to go. But yeah, yeah, it's it is it is kind of disruptive though when you have like a 30 inch screen and you hit start and all of a sudden your 30 yes. inches turns into disruptive blocks. is disruptive is the correct term. It's very um, like you kind of get. This just just disengaged from the operating system. It kind of feels like you know you can, you can still have your desktop on multiple displays. And you can have all your icons and you can have all your applications pinned to the bottom. And as soon as you hit the start menu, you get this bright, colorful interface that is not awful, but it's just not what you expect, I guess. Yeah. The the multiple uh, display aspect doesn't really work out too well. I've been running it basically since it first came out, and it's funny. I was like, the task manager is awesome. I, I can say that. Um, yeah, but the CPU manager. time that I've used in all the Metro apps since three days is 57 seconds. Um, but I have three <laughs> monitors, and trying to use like the the charms bar and the sidebars is just a giant pain. Trying to you know get that yeah. mouse exactly in the right corner without jumping over to the next monitor, it's kind of a challenge at times. Indeed. Um, so yeah, I, I encourage you guys to go check out that editorial that Scott wrote. It's it's it is well discussed and, and debated and that kind of thing so uh, let's move on to our next story and this is a an ssd launch from intel actually the intel 335 series so this is what's unique about this it's the first 20 nanometer product so hopefully one day that means lower prices right alan tell me a little bit about the product uh that's really this is a very very close to i believe it was the 520 the sand force drive that Intel released that was serial ATA 6 gigabit. Mm-hmm. So it, it's basically almost exactly the same thing, except 20 nanometer flash, and the performance is still you know, pretty decent, uh, especially considering that the program times are actually longer or slower on 20 nanometer as compared to 25. So the performance stayed pretty close to um, you know, the prior generation flash under the same controller. Um, and... You know, a decent performer. Uh, you know, obviously didn't blow the doors off of anything else, especially with the likes of Samsung 830 and 840, which have you know come out after that, uh, after right. the Sandforce that drove the 520. Um, but still decent performance. And the key to it is supposed to be the price. Hmm. And I say supposed to be because the MSRPs were really, really low on cost per gig, like three quarters of a dollar per gig, something like that. Which for introductory MSRP was awesome. But then I looked at Newegg after the launch and it was it was higher than that it was like hmm. 80 85 cents a gig so i'm hoping that they can get volume really you know ramp up volume basically just get it to the point where the manufacturer the the resellers aren't just going off of all of the other prices basically sure um and and this is a little bit different for intel where compared to samsung cuz samsung's drive that used mlc on their lower process on their smaller process uh, was labeled the Pro, right? And they said okay. 840 Pro, and they right. did some other stuff to pr- improve performance over the over the 830, et cetera, et cetera, sort of things to justify the the increase in cost of the drive, right? Um, or at least the relative, you know. They they basically said, okay, here's this MLC product. Oh, and by the way, here's a triple level cell as well. That's the cheap one, right? Intel is just going, nope, we're not going to do triple level. We're just going to do MLC at 20 nanometer, and we're going to call that the cheap one. So, okay. Uh, hopefully, it works out that way. Um, there's a there's a few questions we have as far as uh, the media wear indicator thing, as far as how many cycles worth the that flash is supposed to be good for. Right. Um, that's still something that we're looking into. I think it's just uh, Intel failed a little conservative on how the indicator reads. Is it, basically it's a value that shows up in the smart data that you can look up for the drive that gives you an estimate of how much wear is left on the drive. And um, 
20 nanometer flash should be good for at least like 3,000 cycles, and the indicator is acting like it's only good for 1,000 or something like that. So but give me, give me an idea. What, when you say it's only good for 1,000 cycles, what does that mean in terms of how much available bandwidth, not bandwidth, but, but data writing, writing you have? Yeah. Well, you have to take the size of the drive, multiply it by 1,000. So okay. uh, 240 gig drive is what this, the only size this is going to come in. So that's 240 terabytes. Okay. Assuming it was just 1,000, that's an awful lot of data to write to. Right. You know, yeah. To write yeah, to yeah. write to a 240 gig drive, right? Uh, you know how many? How many? It's basically you filled it up, you know, from empty to full uh, worth of capacity a thousand times. So that's that's a lot, right? So and not only that, that, but I probably wouldn't do that in a normal use case scenario. Right, and not only that, but uh, considering this is Sandforce, which actually does compression on the fly before the data hits the flash, mm. um, it's, it's going to be less than that, right? That actually gets written compared to what your your operating system install can probably get compressed maybe like down to 75% worth of what it was, mm -hmm. like what it would be sitting on a disk, right, as far as what was written to the flash. So just examples like that. Uh, text files are compressed down to like, you know, almost 10, 20% of what they were before that goes right. to the flash. So it uh, just depends on what kind of data is being written to it and whatnot. But still, it, this is a regular consumer drive. It only has a three-year warranty. It's not meant to be super long-lasting, um, that sort of thing. But it's still going to be relatively very long-lasting for any average use, right? So what about performance? What do we expect out of this? Uh, the perform performance was actually pretty good. It was actually a little bit better uh, on writes than we've seen from most of uh, the Intel drives. You know how normally they used to, or what they used to do was scale their write speeds based on the capacity points, and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we'd see weird stuff like the 320 series, the smaller capacity of it would only write at like 80 or 100 meg per second. Uh, this drive writes at 450, so yeah. it doesn't really hold back. They, they didn't, didn't do any kind, of, um, you know, any kind of uh, market segmentation tricks or anything like that. They're just like, hey, it's Sandforce, it's going as fast as we can make Sandforce go, just like with, uh, with the 520, but yep. way, way cheaper than the 520. Because remember, that one was like their first 6 gigabit right. uh, or second 6 gigabit drive to come out and uh, it was just like really, really expensive. 520 was also Sandforce, right? I think it was the 520 that was Sandforce. Yeah. I think it was. Okay. So uh, you say in your conclusions that it has good performance. It has potentially low cost per gigabytes. That's just because we, again, haven't seen it for sale yet. Well, it's for sale. It was speculation at that point that the MSRP was going to be really low, but that the resellers were not going to go that low and match the MSRP, um, which is actually what happened. But I'm hoping that really quick that uh, that price can drop down to what Intel's MSRP is. This is one. Of, whenever you have SSDs where everybody is basing it off a of cost per gig, roughly, right? A 240 gig drive is a 240 gig drive. Like when you compare it in a product lineup of a yeah. reseller selling whatever drives, they they don't care. You know, they just assume that the consumers are just going to go, "Okay, well it's about this much cost per gig." Um so unfortunately, yeah, that, that means that the the higher price drives when they come out, the resellers will end up undercutting the MSRP and unfortunately for a drive like this, it's the opposite happens initially. Interesting. So, okay, um, does this change positions in terms of recommended SSDs? Do we still like maybe the Samsung's a little bit above this? Is it all, does it really all come down to cost at this point? Uh, okay, so my beef, and I do have sort of a beef with this, but it's not something I can back up until we've seen these in the wild for a while, is that Sandforce historically has had big-time firmware funky issues, right? Okay. Uh, the, the random yep. stuff we saw from OCZ, Vertex drives, and like Vertex 3 and Agility 3. and I've personally had, out of all the solid-state devices that I have had fail on me over the years of testing, which has been four total, three of them had Sandforce controllers on them. Hmm. So okay. that's, you know, it's, it just it raises the hair on the back of my neck when I, right. when I think about those. You know, it's, right. it's, I'm, I'm more hesitant to recommend those as compared to basically any other controller just on account of their history. Right. And, uh, and they haven't been around long enough with little or no failure reports coming in for me to be convinced otherwise just yet. We seem to be at that point now, but you're just saying it hasn't been a long I enough think, span yeah, of time. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think yeah. they've gotten everything taken care of. I think that they've got whatever the problems were fixed, but they sort of left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths with mm -hmm. losing their data. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm still hesitant to recommend people to to jump right on them. You know, if you're looking for low cost per gig and, and you're good at backing up your data, mm -hmm. 
by all means, go for it. You know, it's, it's, it, it'll be a great drive for you. But just make sure you're backing up, especially if you're doing sand force initially. Or anything for that matter. Or anything for that matter, but especially sand force. All right, let's talk about a, uh, another product review that went out this week, the MSI Z77A GD80 motherboard. This is uh, MSI. So this is MSI's first motherboard with Thunderbolt. I think they have a second one out now or it will be out soon. It's a little bit less expensive, maybe quite a bit less expensive. Um, so this is it's their highest-end Z77 motherboard. The GD80 tends to, tends to get that, that designation. Has a lot of has a lot of features on it besides just Thunderbolt. Um, this is also probably MSI's best overclocking motherboard due to uh, the, the the design and the and the layers that they put into the PCB and that kind of stuff. Just as kind of like a side note, there uh, it does have Thunderbolt support. That's like the shining feature for it. Has three PCI Express slots. Interestingly, if you look at this graph, this is actually the case with I think all Z77 platforms that use three PCI Express slots in the same type of configuration. But um, if you want to use all three of them, you have to use a, an Ivy Bridge processor. If you, you, know, you can't use the third one if you have a Sandy Bridge processor, which I think maybe isn't, as ex- isn't explained or as easily you know, kind of recognizable up front. If you look at the back, you'll see there are only two USB 3.0 ports on the back. There is a front panel header for two additional ones for, you know, like on your case. But you have your Thunderbolt connection, and then you've got uh, what you've got HDMI and VGA for video output, that kind of deal. So um, it does include uh, USB 3 back panel if your system does not have front panel connection on it. So general consensus is this board is actually pretty good. We looked at Thunderbolt performance. That's kind of the thing, the, the specific feature that people will probably be looking at the GD84, GD84, but... We compared its performance with our the first Thunderbolt motherboard we tested, which was the Asus P8Z77V Premium. As we expected, the performance is kind of right on par with it um, using Addo, Iometer, Sandra. They're, they're, they're pretty much neck and neck here. You're able to do the pass-through. You know, if you have a main display port connection going to a monitor, all that works without, without a problem. Uh, Ken actually went through and tested all of the MSI software. Some of it is kind of, as you would expect, not very useful. Some of it is a little bit more useful. The Click BIOS integration was pretty good. Um, shows you how the supercharger works, which is just USB 3 fast charging, and then SafeSync, which is like a um, like a Dropbox like service as well, and they include some of that overclocking. Kim, was that on par with what we saw before as well? I mean, it looks like the limiting factor for these is really going to be more along the lines of the, of the processor and platform, not, necess- not necessarily the specific motherboard. If you're a hardcore guy, they've got the V checkpoints. If you're a low-core guy, they've got OC Genie, right? So you can still hit that button and hit power and get the, the most basic overclocking. Um, what? Let's see. Where did we get our... Uh, so this is with... The OC Genie, is that right? We're able to get 4.2 gigahertz out of it. Um, and that's 4.2 on all the cores, which is, I guess that's like a 500 megahertz increase. But then doing some manual overclocking, we were able to hit 4.7 gigahertz on it. A, a good overall system. Not really going to bother looking at the CPU benchmarks. They are where you would expect them to be as well. So what do we think about the GD80 motherboard? Let's see. Where is the price? How much was this motherboard, Ken? Um, 200 bucks? No. About 249 he's telling me. So $249 for the Z77A GD80. It's on the high side, but it's not as expensive as the Asus Premium motherboard. That's for sure. And they are releasing the Z77A G45. It may already be out. And this is the Thunderbolt motherboard that's a little bit pared down in terms of other features that it adds or that it includes. And this should be like in the 175 to 185 range. It's actually a a pretty compelling product if you're looking for a Thunderbolt-based system, right? If you want to start looking into Thunderbolt accessories, we start 170, Ken saying, yeah, for the G45 motherboard. So that's... You know, in terms of the lowest cost of entry to the Thunderbolt ecosystem, you'll save as much money as you can because you've got to buy those expensive cables. So think about that. So uh, a great board, a little bit on the high side. If you're in the market for Thunderbolt, though, take a look at that. And then finally, we'll go... Um, 
what else did we do this week? Oh, we posted we posted a couple of videos. If uh, last week I talked about the Landtronics XPrint server, you can go back on the PCPro.com and take a look at that video. Posted kind of like a video review of that specific product. And this week I took a look at I don't have it with me, but that's not that big a deal. The Lenovo IdeaPad Yoga 13. So this is a product we first saw at CES. Now it's been productized. They have a 15, a 13. Those are both Ivy Bridge based, and they have an 11, which is actually Tegra 3 WinRT based. So I'm curious to get one of those in too. But this is the uh, laptop, as you can see in the picture here, that has the screen that will fold all the way around behind it uh, to make a tablet. And uh, we did we did have a video. Let's see a video of this as well. I guess I should have loaded this up beforehand. But there's four different positions the laptop can can be in. Let's take a look at that here. So. You've got your standard um, laptop form, right? You've got keyboard on the bottom. All right, Ryan, come on, speed it up in the video here. And then you can see you can lay it all the way flat and then flip it all the way around, and you've got a tablet. Now, it's a 13.3-inch screen, so it's a little bit big for a tablet just to hold. And also, I have a little bit of concern about the back of the, you know, the keyboard. You know, you kind of get... Uh, I, I feel a little bit uncomfortable with the keyboard and trackpad just kind of exposed on the back, either for you to get your, you know, hands on, or you'll see in some of the other modes where um, you actually set it down and, and use it here in this method right here. You'll see use it as they call it stand mode, where the keyboard is actually on the table, and then you bend the screen up a little bit, and now you have a, a tablet like a like a stand based tablet experience. It's nice. I'm a little bit annoyed by the screen vibration shaking when you use it in that way. Ken didn't seem bothered by it when he played around with it. And then the last mode is my favorite one, and this is what they call tent mode. And this actually uh, allows you to use it in a tablet mode, but there is none of that kind of shaking and vibration on the screen, which is kind of nice. And it's adjustable height angle, so if you want to use it on a plane, you might be able to do that, or if you just, you know, you've got it sitting in front of you on uh, a, a kitchen counter or a, a nightstand or um, coffee table or something like that, you can do that and then flip it around and, and it's a laptop. I have to say, we're, we're question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so this keyboard thing, when you flip it around like that, does it know enough to where if you accidentally yes. hit a key, is it going to register or what? Yeah, yeah, when you turn it more than halfway, it disables the keyboard. Okay. So, you know, you can touch the keys and hit the keys and move the trackpad and that doesn't affect anything. I just, wor Good. something about it, it feels overly exposed to the elements in that form factor. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, wouldn't want to. Yeah, like if it, like if the keyboard was flat and something spilled on the table, it would go right it up. It goes into right into the keys and, or if the yeah. table is just kind of dirty and grimy, like maybe you're out at yeah. a Starbucks or you're at a restaurant and you want to show somebody it in talent mode, you set it down on the keyboard and the trackpad. And then, you know, you know, like you're moving around the table and you slide it around to show it to somebody. It just seems kind of like maybe I wouldn't want to do that. That's why I like the tent mode a little bit better. The only thing making contact then with the table are the edges of the laptop. Um, but I, but I, I, want to, I want to say this. We're going to do a full review on it. But my initial impression of it when we saw this at CES was kind of like, well, that's stupid, right? But I, I think... The idea of having this convertible is actually fairly compelling, and I found myself earlier today using my X1 Carbon. After having used the Yoga for a day and a half or two, you know, trying to, to get an idea of what it felt like for everyday use, using my uh, using my X1 Carbon again, where it's just a normal Windows 7 non-touchscreen, where I was doing something today, and Ken was watching me, and I was typing, and then I was like, I reached up to push a button on the website I was on, and I was like, oh wait, this is not a touchscreen. Stupid. So. The idea of having a touchscreen enabled laptop is kind of I don't I don't want to say it's growing on me, but I'm seeing it how you can get used to it very easily and then start to kind of kind of adopt that that thinking behind it. So I don't know. Any, any thoughts on that? I mean it's it's also better to have Windows 8 on when it does have a touchscreen, right? But you can still use the desktop, you can still, you know, use the same applications as opposed to when we tested when we played around with the Vivo tab and the Microsoft Surface that we got in, where it is Windows Metro only, right? You can't run the other applications on it. But so, well, Okay, so here's a touchscreen question. Mode. Yeah. So you're using desktop mode and Windows 8 on that. Okay. Yep. Is it, does it fudge stuff appropriately so that if you just tried to hit the, the, the scroll bar or, the, or an X on a window or something and it's, you're a little bit off, does it figure it out? It's better, but it's not great. Right, okay. so you still have small uh, control points 
when yeah. you're using a touchscreen in a desktop, classic desktop environment. You still have that issue, yes. Um, but like, it's got a trackpad on it, so yeah, you don't have to use it. And and the idea is that when you flip it all the way over into complete tablet mode that you stay inside the Metro interface. You stay inside those types of applications. If you want to, you can go outside of them, but you don't have to. Right. Um, so it's, it's a little bit more interesting to me. And, and the hinge on it is fairly strong. Like if you're sitting there typing, the screen doesn't kind of wobble or fall back or anything like that. Um, so, so that's, that's good. That's something if you're, if I'd be you're, curious that how that lasts over time. But if, if you're in tablet mode completely and you do decide to go into desktop mode and then you're trying to type something in, does a like, keyboard pop up and random stuff like that? Is all that seamless? If you're in tablet mode and you try to type something, yes, keyboard mode does show up. Yeah. Like okay. the, like the screen keyboard yeah. will show up. Yeah. And I think it'll do dictation too. I guess I haven't tried it, but, uh, I know windows eight, you know, like kind of like you can do with your Android phone, your iPhone, um, you know, except except in Windows 8, it's Windows that's doing it, not the cloud. Correct. Right. So yeah. it doesn't have to send out data and all that kind of stuff if you're not on a on a on an actual data connection. So and it's an ultrabook. It's relatively thin. I question the battery life of it a little bit, but I have the same questions about this Lenovo X1 Carbon. I think ultrabooks in general, I have that 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 issue with. Um, and it starts at nine ninety nine. I think the one I have is eleven ninety nine in terms of price. So pretty interesting. It's a it's a I, I'm I'm looking forward to doing the full review on it and kind of coming away with a conclusion because I am personally on a on a mission to find a laptop for me. And I wanted it to be this X one carbon, but I wasn't hundred percent sure about it. And now that Windows eight tablets or Windows eight machines are out that have touch screens and these convertibles, I'm kind of interested in like maybe I should do this and, and kind of move down that that realm. So anybody else have any thoughts? I know Chris you've been using Windows eight a little bit more, but not on a mobile form factor, I don't think. Yeah, no, I haven't I'm I'm actually looking at the uh, HTC eight X phone possibly getting that when that yeah. comes out. But uh, I haven't had a chance to try any of the tablets yet. Um, there is a pop-up store, uh, one of the holiday stores nearby. I was going to swing by and check out the Surface. Uh, yeah, we got the, we got the Surface in, played around with a little bit. It's a really slick, nice piece of hardware. But uh, my, my question there will be how much can, like, the Asus Vivo Tab and the Microsoft Surface really differentiate from each other because they are... Uh, other than the other than other than design of the tablet, they're identical, right? And that's to say that's that's a problem that we've had in the Windows market for a long time, and, and that you have in the Android market is is not so much. But you know, you've got Windows. The Windows 8 on the Lenovo is going to be the same as Windows 8, Windows 8 on Samsung. It's going to be the same as Windows 8 on an Asus laptop. And the same thing with the tablet market now uh, for these RT designs. So. I well, like the surface. Uh, did you get a chance to test out the two keyboards? Or no, no, no. I I, uh, I have the type keyboard in, and I ordered the touch keyboard, and it should be here um, probably Monday. So hopefully by then I'll have knocked out some of these other product reviews out of the way, and we can actually start playing with it because I actually paid money for that product, and I want to make sure we, um, you know, get that out of the way as soon as we can. But it's 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 really interesting. I know we've we've talked about Windows 8 and all that kind of crap on this show quite a bit. I wouldn't say mostly negatively, but at least with the doubts in our mind. And, and I'm starting to feel a little bit better about it, especially knowing on an x86 platform that you still have access to all your applications and you can still use desktop environments and you can still do all that same kind of thing. Um, but, yeah, if somebody said, do I need to upgrade to Windows 8? My answer is still no still it's not necessary for anything but when you buy a new machine a new laptop it's going to be on there um all right let's uh take a look at what's next oh wait we have to thank today's podcast sponsor i know you guys have been looking forward to this all week let's say hello to our friend alex from msi the all new z77 m power mainboard from msi is poised to change the overclocking game Every Z77 M-Power board will have a factory 24-hour military-class burn-in test completed before shipping. Additionally, performance-optimized features such as GoToBIOS, MultiBIOS 2, V-Checkpoints, Bluetooth 3.0, and onboard Wi-Fi allow users convenience and total system control over their overclocking and gaming experience. This is the new endurance champion, Z77 M-Power from MSI. Thank you, Alex, for that. Now, 
Chris, you are on the podcast this week. We had we had a, we had um, an empty bald guy spot, and um, <laughs> you fill you filled that you filled that. Yeah, I am the uh, I'm the uh, stand in for Josh this week. Right, and and you are for people who maybe don't know, and I feel bad I didn't really introduce you very well at the beginning. You do our networking stuff, kind of just starting uh, that with our last ASUS article, and we have another router review that's, that's queued up to go out. We don't have any networking stuff to talk about, so feel free to butt in with your comments and thoughts on this, especially when we get into the in-depth, gritty, very important news like Corsair announcing mouse mats. So, I, I definitely will. Yeah. What's the bandwidth on those, do you know? What's that? What's the uh, bandwidth requirements for those? Uh, they're very the, – the bandwidth requirements are high. Uh, you need – a lot, uh, low ping times for this mouse to work, or for the, I'm sorry, if this mousing surface to work. I don't know. I, I asked them to send me a couple of these. I really have no idea what what to think about them. It's the it's part of their Vengeance series. It's their new brand behind all their accessories, keyboards, and mice. And Aren't these the ones we passed out at QuakeCon? No, no. Mm. Well, you know what? Those might have been prototypes. Are those the ones Jeremy was? Remember the remember the ones about? that Robert Brank that smelled bad, like he was complaining yeah. about how they smelled. Oh, yeah. Right, I think I think there might have been some some prototypes about it. Who knew? Um, so the MM two hundred, MM four hundred. Uh, the only thing I really care about is how big they get, because only size matters, kids. The four hundred is almost a square meter. Nine hundred and fifty centimeters square. <laughs> Holy crap! Is that really? You're gonna need a big desk. Nice. We do have a. That can't be that big. Do I need to do I need to bust out my Ripper XXL? And no, no, no. It's not a, me- a meter squared would be a thousand, a hundred times a hundred centimeter squared, right? Which would be much more than Much 900. more than this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so you need the square root well, of this. Depends on how they're putting it, because they could be saying 957 on both sides. No, God, no. God, no. That's, that's, like, <laughs> that's, like, kitchen, that's like kitchen table size. I know. <laughs> Uh, it two yardsticks up. It does say oversized. Because it costs more than the wide one of the previous series, which has already got to be pretty big. Well, so it's what? $29.99? $29.99 for the MM400. Right? I don't, I don't get it. It's got a one-year warranty, though. So they got that going for them. Are these for sale yet? Hopefully they didn't. They just sent me some power supplies, but they didn't send any of this. They, need, with it. they need this. What's that? They need this size. <laughs> What the hell is that? What this is, is a Ripper a XXL. Oh my god, maybe it is that big. That's what I'm wondering. that big? Because <laughs> oh otherwise god. it's only like 30 centimeters. And that's not that big. Huh. Huh. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Huh? That's kind of big. I bought this knowing full well I wasn't going to use it. Well, that's dumb, but okay. <laughs> I figured I would just make it. I, if I need a desk blotter, that right. happens to be a mouse pad. You could take photos on that, right? It might be good for that, a nice matte finish on it and stuff. Yeah, that's true. Um, so apparently Corsair Gaming mouse mats are engineered from the ground up to deliver the consistent performance that gamers demand so they can focus on winning, uh, whatever that means. So, Their desk. That's annoying. <laughs> that's huge. That's huge. You said 957 square centimeters, correct? Yep. That's 148 square inches. So what would that be? I don't... Math is hard. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Alan was asking... That's only, that's only, that's, about three foot by three that's foot, only like it could 12 be by 30 12. centimeters. That's a foot by a foot. Yeah. I mean, that's, guys doing that's not math that big, on the podcast. Though. That's not that big. That know. doesn't seem like extreme ultra gaming surface. You are correct. I, I would agree that with that. That seems like... <laughs> Yeah, I, I not, yeah, now that you think not too much, I agree with that. Uh, also, Corsair announced updated Hydro Series H60 and H55. The H60 has obviously been around for a while. Uh, nothing. What's 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 changed in these, Jeremy? Do you remember anything exciting? Uh, well, the 55 is essentially an updated uh, 50, so it keeps pretty much the exact same specs that the other one had, just uh, some newer materials, and uh, from what I remember, it's got wider tubing. The H60 is sort of a newer, interesting one, which is it's designed uh, to be pretty much completely silent. 
hmm. and even at high levels. So it's, it's sort of for the more extreme users. The 55 is more for the people who don't want to hear their machine at all. But from the 60, it sounds like it's going to be fairly decent. I will say... And the footprint isn't that big. Go ahead. Sorry. I was just saying the footprint isn't that big. You're essentially installing it on a 120 millimeter fan hmm. uh, piece on your uh, case. So it's not like you're going to need something right. huge. You can put it in smaller systems, which is nice. And they also describe what they call a magnetic mounting socket with that one, which I'm not exactly sure what they mean. So that must, yeah, but, so that's this one right here, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it, supposedly it's going to make the installation even easier, Good. and the tough composite route tubing is not... It'll be more forgiving than the other stuff was, because huh. some people bought it, thought, oh, I don't even have to think about this, I just slap it in, and then, you know, a kink would slowly form. Right. I, I'm all for easier installation, because we uninstall and reinstall these a lot in our, in our test beds, and Ken particularly hates uh, the ones like this that have, like, the teeth, the teeth on them. Um... Magnets sound awesome, but it also I don't mm, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what to yeah. think about that. I don't know what to think about that. Uh, we'll we'll get one in and take a look and see if insulation is actually easier, or if it's better in any other way. So, speaking of Windows 8 and tablets that we were talking about a little bit before, uh, Tim has a couple of news posts for us on the continued release of ASUS products based on Windows 8. How about a new line of VivoBook laptops running Windows 8? What's a VivoBook? I don't really know. Uh, what's that? Yeah, and also, yeah, look at this picture. This is, this is what happens when you let people use Photoshop that don't have any sense. Look, look at the size of this human being. We are supposed to assume it's an adult. Take a look at their hand compared to the size of the laptop. So, Which at best is what, 14 inches? Well, I don't know. According to the scale, it looks like it's about 30. It's a 30-inch <laughs> laptop would be my guess. I don't, I don't really know. So uh, the Vivo book, uh, they are Ultrabooks, I believe. Are they Ultrabooks or are they just – they're not Ultrabooks? Okay. Uh, but they are Core i3 based on uh, options, and then they also have Pentium and Celeron based. So these are going to be a little bit lower cost, 1366 by 768 resolution screens, um, preload with Windows 8 or Windows 8 Pro. Let's see, what did they say anything else interesting? About three, let's see, the S400 is 3.96 pounds, and the X202 is 3.08 pounds. And here's what's what's interesting, is the Core i3 3217 version is a listed price of $599. And that's actually not too bad, right? So if we look at the X202 Core i3 processor, that's an 11.6 inch screen. Now you're getting into, that's almost the same price as like the Vivo Tab RT or the Microsoft Surface. These are Tegra 3 based Windows RT tablets versus whole laptops running Windows 8 with 802.11n, USB 3, HDMI, VGA, SD card reader, full version of Windows, all your applications you can you know normally think to run, same resolution screen essentially at uh, 1366 by 768. And then the the higher end one, the S400 starts at only 699. So, and then with that one you get a 14 inch model. I don't really like a 14 inch screen at 1366 by 768. That seems a little seems a little much. But uh, you do get a 24 gig SSD cache drive as well. So competition is competition in this 400 to 700 dollar price point is going to be very interesting throughout Christmas, especially as we start to see sales from different vendors and Black Black Friday deals and all that kind of stuff. It could it could be could be pretty compelling with all that. And then uh, finally, the ZenBook. These are not 599 dollars. ZenBook is their Ultrabook brand. I know uh, uh, Alan has had one for a little while, one of the original ones. These are now updated with Windows 8. I believe they have touchscreens. Surely, I, I guess they don't have to have touchscreens, but they do. I, I, think, I, think I, they thought, do. I thought they might. Uh, they have models with IPS displays, backlit keyboards, multi-touch track pads. And um, the UX31A can even be outfitted with a capacitive touchscreen. So they don't come with it. They don't all come with it. So yeah. that's that's interesting to keep an eye on. I noticed I noticed that one had a number pad on it that you just scrolled past. It does. That is the UX forty two VS. So if we look at the specs, UX forty two VS is a fourteen inch. Um, hmm. So yeah, fourteen inch screen with a 
That's that uh, that's unique to see. I know, that might be the first Ultrabook I've seen with a number pad. Yeah, I would agree with that. Hmm? Yeah, yeah I stuff. guess I guess 14 inches is enough space for that. Yeah. Yeah, just um, enough. Yeah. Interesting. So uh, they basically Asus has updated everything they've ever made for Windows 8. Do you think there's going to be too much on the market? I mean, between all these new Ultrabooks and the hybrids and the the tablets now with keyboards, I mean, are regular consumers going to walk into the store and just be lost of what they need to get? Yes. Yeah, very much so. I mean, because what you'll you'll see, you're going to see two different sets of things, right? The what I would consider maybe this ZenBook update because there are optional touchscreens, which is just hey. Here's slightly updated versions of our laptop with Windows 8. And then here is our innovative designs based around touch capability on Windows 8. And that's where you're going to get uh, like the, the, the Asus Tai Chi and where you're going to get the Lenovo Yoga and whoever's making the, um, the machine that actually has like, maybe is it Dell that has the screen that flips inside the frame, I think. Uh, th- those are going to be interesting, but... I think I think those specialized units are a little bit separated. Like if you you go into the to a Best Buy or a Fry's or whatever uh, hellhole you have to go in to buy your machines from, you know, hopefully the salesperson knows enough to say, well, do you want do you want a touchscreen tablet or do you want just a laptop? And here's they'll have them segmented out in those two different two different time spans. But I think the average consumer that just goes out, I think what you'll find is a lot of people will buy a laptop and find out later that. It can also be a tablet with a touchscreen, or it also has a touchscreen, but they weren't expecting that, uh, you know, because I think a lot more machines will just start shipping with touchscreens by default now. Even though I think, as a general rule of thumb, a touchscreen kind of lessens the quality of the screen a little bit, or, do, or are we past that? I think we're past that? Okay. So, but yeah, that, that's a good thought. Well, apart from the layer of grease. <laughs> I can't see anything through all these fingerprints. Very true. Uh, and also speaking of Windows 8 this week, this past week, actually on Windows 8 uh, holiday, as I called it, on Friday, we built a PC and we installed Windows 8 on it. I don't know why necessarily. I was, I was building a new PC for me, and I thought, okay, I'm going to do this anyway. Might as well stream it. Maybe somebody will be interested. And I expected to have you know, 10, 20 people on there. We actually had like 150 people watch me build this PC, um, not blindfolded. But I post this picture here just for reference. Sorry, no, I will not be doing it blindfolded this time because I wanted to actually build this and use it myself. So I wanted it to be nice and stable and reliable. Uh, But build a system, did Windows 8 installation because I had actually personally never done a Windows 8 install. It's about as simple as you would expect. Um, Installing a a system is about the same as you would normally expect. We had some some negative comments in our YouTube uh, comment thread because they're like, why is why is it building a system with Windows 8? It's no different than building a system with Windows 7. It's like, well, yeah, okay. No, I think we all understood that the hardware is going to be the same here. Uh, I would say the Windows 8 install is uh, a little bit easier than I expected. A little bit more simple. It takes you through a nice little tutorial. When you start it up, uh, you get to select your color scheme. And uh, you can see here we've even got the uh, Mickey Mouse ears in the shot as well. And then... Uh, Ran a little late trying to fix some video stuff. That was an odd little glitch we had. We're trying to do mirroring out of it, but um, nothing too exciting there. So if you want to see, if you want to watch me build a PC, you can look up that video. If if you want some background noise while you're cooking or something like that, that's what I assume people do with that kind of stuff. Uh, who wants to tell me about Microsoft giving away free Media Center keys for Windows 8? Anybody else read this story that Tim posted? Uh, yeah, actually, I got a couple of them. Uh, just because I run two media centers right now, um, you can get you can only get one per email address. Uh, but if you have more than one email address, there is actually fine print somewhere that you can get five per person. Huh. Um, but it was simple. You go in, you put an email address in, you put a, a capture code in, and hit a button, and within a day or so, a key shows up in your mailbox. So what is um, this? What is this useful for? Right. So you have to have Windows 8 Pro already. Is that right? Yeah, uh, Windows Media Center used to come with all the versions of Windows 7, well, all the main versions, not the starter and stuff. But right. you have to have Windows Pro to run Media Center now, and it's an add-in pack. And until January 31st or January 1st, I don't remember, 
um, they're giving it away for free. And then it's just, you go into add remove programs, you know, you grab it, right. um, and, and it'll download it and then you just put the key in and you're good to go. Scott had a really good comment on it as for the reasoning behind this. So, you know, they have to pay a little bit of a licensing fee for every time they have media center edition installed on a, on a configuration, um, because I guess because of DVD playback and that kind of stuff. So rather than just blanket it out to everybody for all licenses all the time, it seems to me like they're, they're trying hard to give you Media Center Edition for free as long as you actually want to use it. So they're, you know, they're doing things like um, giving it away for free on their website and, and other you know, promotions like that saying, hey, if you want it, we're, we're going to give it to you, but we don't want to, we'd rather give it to 400,000 of you than 4 million of you because we have to pay for each one of those licenses that we give out. So I guess it's not too big of a deal as long as they continue to have these weird kind of quirky ways that you can get a free Media Center, Media Center Edition key. Uh, and I'm going to go grab a few of them now that you told me that. And use them. Use them before the end of January as well. Because right, not yeah, only does the free key offer end, the free, free keys will stop working as well. So you just have to activate if you've already, it by that. By the if you already activated it, you're good. Okay. Oh, that's, uh, I can't think of any reason why there would be piracy involved after January. <laughs> I'm sure that's what I'm saying is I'm sure after January they'll just have a different promotion of some kind to, to give it because it feels to me like they're trying desperately to give you Media Center Edition if you want to use it. Like, you know, I, it, it seems reasonable to me. So, uh, Also in the news here, what else did we post? ASRock launches Extreme 6 TB4 motherboard with two Thunderbolt ports as if we didn't have enough Thunderbolt motherboard talk earlier. This one has gold accessories, black design to it. It's kind of cool. Um, dual Thunderbolt ports. We've saw a dual Thunderbolt motherboard from Gigabyte a little bit earlier. What is it? U UP5TH. We're gonna. I think we're gonna build a Hackintosh around that eventually too, and see if we can get Thunderbolt to work on the Mac OS. Uh, so if you're interested in that, take a look at uh, uh, another option. As we see more of these options, only, the only really specifically good thing is that we'll start to see lower prices on the motherboards as well. And I wish Josh were here for this because this is an interesting discussion, but uh, I would like to hear your guys' input as well. AMD announced it will build 64-bit ARM processors for server markets. Uh, not for consumer products, at least not now, but they are going to build, they have licensed an ARM core uh, a future one, I guess it was just announced this week, a 64-bit ARM core. They did not license the architecture, they licensed the core, which means they're not going to build their own custom processor. They're going to build an SOC around a specific core, but the quote, secret sauce that they're using is the technology they got from C-Micro, which was a, uh, as they now call it, freedom fabric, which sounds very patriotic of them. That uh, it's, it's a communications fabric, uh, a tr uh, uh, kind of like hypertransport, maybe a little bit. At least it's the same veins, the same idea of that allows these processors to communicate in an efficient manner without having to saturate PCI Express buses, network attachment buses, those types of things. So it has its own kind of dedicated communication. And the, the thing that AMD was trying to sell us on during the presentation was that they're building these for servers. So Jeremy has talked on the on the podcast several times about the arm coming into the server room move and amd thinks they'll have a leg up because they said you know taking a thousand arm processors and putting them in servers is easy taking a thousand arm processors and putting them in servers and having them all communicate is much more difficult and now you've they said uh, i think one of the lines they used i don't know if i have the exact quote in here was that they you were taking if you just blanketed ARM processors into a server farm room, you're basically taking the compute problem away from the from the server onto the network, right? You're taking your something else has to manage all of that. So you're either going to have to increase compute power with more ARM processors or or standard x86 processors. And their claim is with the Freedom Fabric that you will not have to do that. That their servers, uh, their chips will be able to communicate in a much more efficient matter now this isn't going to be something that's out until 2014 so nothing that we're you know looking forward to in the next week or so but it's um significant both because another push for arm in the server room and now we have all the debates about is amd going to completely leave the x86 ecosystem in the not too distant future i don't think that's the case but um 
I kind of view this as a as a stopgap for them. They're they're losing market share in the server in the server world pretty dramatically, and that used to be their strongest, most profitable area. Uh, and, and and maybe they're seeing this as a stopgap in order to get some income is to, hey, this ARM thing might be big. Maybe it'll get to double-digit saturation, and we can be the best one there. We had the most experience in the server market. We have, you know, the AMD Opron brand still has some name recognition. The AMD, we, we know how this ecosystem works, so they may be uh, beneficial to that, say, as opposed to what TI or Qualcomm or somebody would do in that same ecosystem. Anybody have any thoughts on this? I know, Jeremy, this is something you've talked about a few times. Mm. Well, I mean, it's going to be really nice that AMD doesn't have to compete against ARM. I mean, you know, no matter if ARM makes giant inroads into the server room or not, it's still going to take some of the market share. So at this right. point, AMD is like, well, instead of having to fight them and Intel and everybody else that's trying to make this move uh, to systems, which is just large amounts of systems on a chip, uh, why not work with ARM? There we can say, hey, there's not so much of a problem. We're not going to be looking at competing against these guys just in case this, when they do finally put out a 64-bit uh, processor arm uh, and it suddenly turns out to be great, well, AMD can take advantage of that. If it turns out that, well, you know, it's, it's okay, but it's, it's not so good for a lot of applications, well, AMD didn't purchase, you know, technology to change their existing chips. They're just adding a bolt-on. So they're going to have, I'm sure, non-arm machines as well. And can just sell their own brand, so it's sort of a win-win for them either way. Yeah. Anybody else? No. It's, 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 it's incredibly complicated. I don't posit to understand all of it. The the whole sixty-four bit thing. I, you know, in terms of what are what is ARM actually going to do in the server market? They actually had they had Facebook and Red Hat at their announcement. So that's actually a good sign. Facebook seemed to be very upbeat about using ARM servers in their uh, just, just it's got to be an enormous IT platform that they're running on, right? So what are they going to use it for? Um, they have very specific needs. Uh, there was an interesting slide that I don't have in this story that, talked, that kind of showed what workloads work best on x86, which ones work best on ARM. And it was, as you would imagine, small, quick processes like Apache servers, web servers, things like that, that, they, that can benefit a lot from an ARM architecture that runs power efficiently. Now, we're not talking about raw performance, we're talking about performance per watt. And the more performance per watt you can get into a single U of rack space uh, would be beneficial. So uh, we, we, we have a, a little bit of a story up there on PCPro.com about it. And it has their whole press release if you're interested in reading what they have to say about the partnership. It's a little, it's not, I don't want to say it's unexpected because we did kind of expect it, but it doesn't make it any less uh, compelling, you know, drama in the market, right? Now you've got the second biggest x86 manufacturer moving into the ARM architecture, the ARM core business. So interesting, interesting stuff. Uh, last couple of stories, Intel... Did anybody read this? Intel wants to see 48 core processors in future smartphones. Huh? Huh? Nobody want to yeah. use that, that cooler or that setup in this picture in your phone? They also want to see a 50-pound battery. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like the comment that you mentioned in there that, you know, there's very there, – there's not a whole lot used for that much multi-threading. At least for a while. I mean, for who's going to be able to write applications that can use 48 threads? Right. And even today on the PC, we have issues using eight threads. It really comes down to if yeah. you're doing multitasking. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, let's see. Tim wrote in his story that analyst Patrick Moorhead argued that in five to ten years is effectively an eternity in technology time. And by the time the hardware with massive numbers of cores is feasible, the software will be there. Intel's a little bit opt less optimistic, but hopefully developers will embrace the idea of multiple low-power cores versus a few high-clocked, power-hungry ones. I mean, we're already kind of seeing that progression in the mobile world now, right? You've got uh, Qualcomm has quad cores. Tegra, Tegra 3 that's powering the Surface and is powering the Vivo tab is a quad core part. So there, there's, there are some benefits to it there. I wonder if we're on like an accelerated timeline in terms of we, we're... We're, maybe we're moving to multi-core too early in the mobile markets. Because we did the we same thing on the desktop side. Well, mm -hmm. yeah. We, we, you, you mean um, with, with like the desktop parts? 
with like CPUs. Yeah, I mean the the CPUs were out with you know dual core and even up to quad core really before the the developers caught up to using the multi core stuff. Yeah, I meant more. That's that's true, but I meant more along the lines of we they went to dual core because they had no other answer technologically. Like we had a frequency wall and they couldn't go any further without massive changes in voltage and all that kind of stuff. So how do we get more performance? Oh, okay, let's just slap another core on there. And I kind of feel like in the ARM world, what we've done is, did we actually hit that frequency wall with single core ARM processors? And is that why we're going to multi-core? Or are we going to multi-core because, well, it sells better and it sounds better. Maybe we'll find a use for it, that type of thing. I don't really know. <laughs> And at worst, we'll just disable 46 of the cores and your phone will ever only use two. <laughs> just disable 46 <laughs> of them. You got a nice, power-efficient, dual-core dual core processor. It would be interesting to, to know if, you know, does two cores running at, say, one gigahertz use the same amount of power as one core at two? Because um, I mean, if they ran 48 one gigahertz cores versus one massive core. I mean, in general, the answer is no. Two one gigahertz cores will use less power than one two gigahertz core. But it all depends on your power curve, right? That's whole. That's all process technology. That's all. That's all circuit design. If it if you have to run that chip at 2.5 volts to get two gigahertz, but you can run it at one volt to get one gigahertz out of it, then it makes more sense to have two one gigahertz parts running at two volts total, which is half a volt less than what you could run one at. But then you get into issues of can the software take advantage of it and all that kind of deal. So um, this is a this is a kind of a far out thing. Obviously, they're talking about 48 core system on a chip designs, but uh, at least at least somebody is working on something like that. And our last story is about the Kraken. Everybody has self-contained water coolers. Now everybody plus one has self-contained water coolers. NZXT is unleashing the Kraken. I feel like this should be a liquor commercial, right? You know, for the for the rum. Never mind, guys. Um, world's first all-in-one 140 millimeter and 280 millimeter liquid cooler. So these are a little bit different than what we have seen before. Uh, the Corsair H55 and H60 are 120 millimeter. Corsair H100 is 240, so you know two 120s. So now they're basing it off of a 140 millimeter size radiator and fan uh which is better it will be better it'll be able to more efficiently cool a little bit uh larger wattage higher wattage capability but you get into a little bit more concern about case compatibility and system compatibility because not every case that supports 120 millimeter fans also supports 140 millimeter fans uh, i think more and more do that like the 550d definitely had whole uh you know rivets the openings for 120 and 140 as well as 240 and 280 so uh interesting stuff there but they are they're i would say they're are they aggressively priced 99 dollars for the single unit for the 140 and 139 for the 240 millimeter version uh, yeah so the h100 is about 100 to 100 and Fifteen dollars or something like that too. So, in the in the right price range, maybe we'll come down a little bit lower when it actually gets into the um, into the market. Jimmy, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, I like the fact that you can go completely overboard with the one forty and install an extra two fans on it, so that you'll actually have four of them going. Do they supply At the that screws point? It's for not that? going to fit in any case. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would guess. Yeah, I would guess not. Did they show a picture of that? Because I would love to see that. Let's no, see. but I'm assuming you bolt them onto the outside. Just, just, just have infinite fans out the back of your case. Yeah. If you duct tape it or gaff tape it, you could probably get eight or ten to to stay up there reliably. Yeah, just right? make sure you don't alternate them. That sound. That sounds like a uh, sounds like a challenge. How many How many 120 millimeter fans do we have sitting around? Hmm. Indeed, and you can see the uh, installation style is kind of what we saw before as well. So uh, another company entering into the world of self-contained closed-loop water cooling. I love, the, I love the idea. We use them all the time here. I think they have replaced the high-end air cooler just, just because they're kind of – I say this, but they're not always quieter. Some of the pumps on these things are annoyingly loud. So we'll have to see if that, if that changes anything. Uh, with these, but uh, what, what was the? Um, didn't we have an issue with one of the major vendors kind of suing somebody? 
Wasn't uh, Ace Attack Soul and Cool It? Anybody remember that story? Nobody. It was a while ago. Uh, I think it's it's fairly recent because it, it might have affected what Corsair was able to do with their products because Corsair is now the largest reseller of these self-contained closed-loop water coolers. So, um, should be, I don't know. Obviously, yeah, I guess it was the end of August. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll we'll see if anything comes of that, but. Hopefully they're not going to make us stop selling these these cool devices. So that is actually uh, it's the end of our news and reviews section. So we're going to get into our hardware software picks of the week. I don't know if, Chris, you had time to pick anything. I'm going to give you a little bit uh, uh, of a stall here. Actually, I need to stall myself because I didn't bring up the, uh, the thing. So my pick is actually we had a, a fan of the show that is actually a game developer. And he had an indie game, I, I hate using that terminology, but he had a game on Steam that he wanted us to play uh, and promote and talk about or at least uh, offer up some stuff for it. So what we're going to do is, <clears throat> I'm going to bring up his email now too. Don't show my screen here while I bring up his email. I don't want his name and an email address out there. His name is Francois, I believe. There we go. And his game is called Symphony. Now it's on Steam. It is relatively modestly priced, $9.99. And it actually uses your music collection to create levels and uh, to, as they call it, your music is under attack and you play this this kind of, uh, I guess we'll call it an overhead shooter style game. That looks pretty cool. With your music in there. It's, it's very fast paced. It's very intense. Um, the system that I installed it on didn't have any music on it, so it was only using the default music that comes with it, and it, that that stuff I wasn't a big fan of. But it was, uh, it was, it's it's bright. It's definitely bright. It's definitely bright and colorful. Uh, and he gave us a handful of keys to give out. So what we're gonna do is, I don't know. We're gonna have you send an email to podcast at pcper.com. I think we have ten keys. So he gave us ten keys. Handout. So if you send an email with symphony in the title to podcast at pcper.com, I will pick ten winners and we'll we'll email you guys keys to this to this Steam game. We you know, we, we try to support everybody who supports the PC Perspective podcast. We wanna we wanna get this into your hands so you guys he obviously wants people to try it out and talk about it and you know, see what you guys think. So uh yeah, I'll be curious. I'm gonna actually I do wanna try this out with my own music. Because the music that was on there, I wasn't a big fan of, to say the least. So, uh, I hope. Who was it that said earlier that they hope the death metal didn't didn't kill the game, didn't break the game? So we'll see. No, it didn't. Oh, okay. All right, you gave it a shot. Yes, well, break the some of the other the stuff game. that it wasn't quite sure about. So, you, if you want to see more about that game, you can go to uh, steampowered.com or open up your Steam client and look up the game Symphony, and it's and it's in there. Uh, I would give you the Steam app URL, but it just has a weird number in it, so it's not very memorable. But uh, go, to your, go to Steam and look up Symphony. And uh, thanks a lot for the keys, and we're, we're going to go ahead and pass them on to you guys. So cool beans on that. Jeremy, you got something substantial to pick for us? No, not substantial, but uh, as we said earlier, they're giving out free keys to Media Center if you pick up Windows 8. You've got until the end of January to actually activate it. Pick it up. Grab it. Just go there. Type in your email address. As uh, was pointed out earlier, you can have up to five of them. If you don't use it, you might run into somebody else that might want it. And boom, there you go. Really cheap Christmas present. Here, have Windows Media Center. It's handy if you ever hook up your computer to your uh, cable vision and want to use it as a PVR instead of dumping 500 bucks or whatever your local cable provider wants to charge you for a PVR. Nice. Well done. Uh, Alan, next on the list. Okay, so uh, I thought this was free, and it used to be, <laughs> but I guess it's not anymore. Um, cool. It's five bucks, you. though. Okay. Uh, and there's a try before you buy version of it. It's called Start 8. It is meant for Windows 8. It basically takes the crazy, overwhelming start button, whatever, Metro, all that stuff that gets thrown in front of your face, and it just sort of transmogrifies it down into what looks like the old start menu hmm. from Windows 7. All right. Okay. All right. So, I'm watching, um, we're watching a video here. And okay. Oh, man. What? Yeah. Don't play it? Actually, it looks even better 
looking at their website compared oh, yeah, to. Remember those days when you had before. a start menu? Mm -hmm. Wasn't that amazing? I well, I mean, they, okay, so what they had the before was it, it was what it used to do before during <laughs> the beta was it would take the Metro UI and sort of shrink it down into like if you started typing, it would just sort of shrink it so it didn't take up over the whole screen. But it looks yeah. like they've made it into a real start menu replacement now. Yeah, that's why they're charging for it now. Which is which is good. It's that's a regular looking. Yeah, they're just typing stuff in. It's showing up like normal. Wow, hmm. that's pretty cool, actually. And there's also it also completely bypasses Metro upon boot up if you want. Okay. So it just All goes right. straight to desktop. So when you hit the start button, like you never see that Metro interface. Like, what if you want to go see the Metro interface? I wonder. Uh, yeah, I there's something there's wrong with it. To do it. I think it's like I think it's like <laughs> shift start or something like that. I forget. Oh, so it does, okay. So it does work. It says so you can still now it says you can pin desktop and Metro apps, so you can still run a Metro app from the desktop that way. Huh, I wonder if Microsoft's going to close whatever loophole they're using because they yeah. knocked out a bunch of that stuff in the beta. I don't know. Yeah, I don't. Uh, you never know. You never know. Based on Scott's theories, I'd say yes. Based on my thoughts, I would say why bother doing it. But again, what do I know? Chris, do you have a pick for us? Yeah, since uh, today seems to be uh, almost free day. Uh, on Monday, MechWarrior Online went into open beta. So if you have any interest in the old MechWarrior games, uh, there's a company called Piranha Games that's doing a reboot of it, and it's actually a lot of fun. I've been uh, messing around with it for a couple of months, and it'll beat up your computer pretty bad, but uh, it's pretty detailed and pretty good version of MechWarrior. All right, and Ken wanted to throw his pick of the week in here as well, just because we were talking about it earlier. So here, take a look at this picture, guys. This is what happens when you take a Corsair H100 and apply, how many fans are? 40, yes, 40 of their SP120 Performance Edition fans. Why? Why, Why not? Why not? Yes, exactly. Now, did, did they give results here on if you actually see better temperatures? <laughs> no. Or is it just more? <laughs> it's 18-minute video. Oh, and I'm it's sure probably, it's absolutely it's probably silent. adding. All right, it's probably go. adding more heat due to the extra friction work that all of those fans are doing to the air before it gets to the core. <laughs> yeah, that's not right. Minus 10 C. Uh, I think you're full of crap. I don't know what they're doing with that. What? Wouldn't every one of those fans need to have a little bit of an offset? I mean, I don't know. Wait, wait. I don't. Th I don't think they're getting much <laughs> more airflow. Obviously, a sane individual. Oh, those are all the extra rings you get with the fans. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. That can't. That's that's obviously not correct. Yeah. And then, because I think he has a, uh, what's that? Oh well, interesting idea. Not really, but funny <laughs> But funny to see, I guess I'll say. <laughs> All right, so that's going to wrap up the show for this week, guys. If you are watching live, uh, we're going to try to play some Left 4 Dead 2. We will stream that out. If you can't join us, if you can join us, uh, we're going to try one of two things use on our, using our game.pcpro.com server or hosting it, hosting it locally here. Um, let's see, any other points of interest if you want to send us an email it is podcast at pcper.com if you want to win one of those keys send an email to podcast at pcper.com make sure you use the subject line symphony and thanks to francois for those keys to hand out for you guys and uh i guess that's it if you haven't told everybody about this podcast please do so pcper.com slash podcast uh last week we had linus on it was a lot of fun I think we got some new uh, listeners and viewers from that as well. So please keep spreading the word. Tell them about how funny and witty and knowledgeable we are about computer hardware and all things technology. Right, guys? Right? Huh? <laughs> yeah, and, and right on cue as well. We're always right on cue with the quips. So um, do that. And if you want to join us live, pcper.com slash live. Uh, we do interesting things before the show and sometimes after. Wednesdays at 10 p.m. is when we uh, record it. That's Eastern time. So that's going to wrap up the show this week, guys. Thanks again. We will be back next week. Happy Halloween to everybody. I'm Ryan Shrout. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. 
There's no Josh, so that's you, Alan. Oh, that's Alan Malventano. Move on to the next person. <laughs> and I'm Chris Barberry. Oh, I was muted. It's like it's like we never do this podcast <laughs> every week. <laughs> he's still working out the math. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's on a candy high. He's not quite sure what's going on now. Yep. <laughs>